Hey everybody, I have got two great guests on the line for us today. We're going to be talking about a movie. It's actually a documentary called Oleg Big Beatoff's Documentary. And we have the producer and one of the actors from this particular movie. We have Joan Bo Borston, who is the producer, and she was the wife of Oleg. And then we also have Costa uh, Ronin here, and he's the actor that played uh, portrayed uh, Oleg in the in the movie and I'm so excited to have you guys here we're gonna have some fun talking about the movie learning a little bit about you and of course just having fun talking so welcome to the show thank you thank you thank you thank you I was just I was just the voice, <laughs> I, just didn't, the voice. I didn't play Oleg I I was I was fortunate enough to uh to be the voice of Oleg Bidov in the in the film well, that's interesting. So I'm going to learn how we did that, and um, this is going to be a, this is going to be a little bit of a of a fun fun experience for me. So I guess let's kind of start off with uh, the movie. What? How did the movie come about? What was the inspiration behind the movie? So my husband, who was um, like the Robert Redford of Russia, defected um, very dramatically in 1985. And um, he passed unexpectedly in May 2017. Uh, and he had been writing his autobiography for three years. So he left me, he always left me, he always gave me huge projects to do. So he left me his autobiography to finish with a list of something like 72 people to interview to fill in the gaps in the chapters he hadn't finished. Um, and um, as I was getting ready to, I finally got out of bed like in, six months later or seven months later. And I said, oh, he left me a project. I'm gonna to have to get going and get this book done for him. And as I was beginning to do travel plans, my friends from the film industry said, Joan, you gotta record, you know, you have to film those interviews because first of all, none of his friends are getting younger or healthier. And secondly, it's probably a really great documentary because he had an amazing life. So I set out, I did the first of three or four trips and I flew first to Canada, then to um, uh, um, Belgrade, then to Sarajevo, then to um, Austria, and then to um, Berlin. And it was pretty clear by Berlin that we had a movie. So um, it took me more than two years to interview all of these people. Um, and um, I put together a crew um, of um, people who knew something about the Soviet Union, because as Costa will tell you, it's a hard country for the rest of us to understand if we don't have background in it. Um, and so the first person that I hired was the director who was Nadia Tass, who um, is from Australia. She's won tons of awards for her work in feature films, um, but she knew about the Soviet Union because her, her grandparents had escaped from the Bolshevik revolution and come to Greece where she was born um, but they were culturally Russian, so they raised her reciting Russian poetry and acting out Russian plays. And then um, both editors turned out to um, have a lot of background in doing films about the Soviet Union, and they'd been in, in Moscow. Um, and it just kind of went from there. And then um, uh, we needed um, a voice of Oleg, and it was very important to me that the voice, which turned out to be Kosta, um, was someone who actually spoke Russian fluently, but was understandable in English, and he was perfect for that. And, um, and then as a narrator, um, we use Brian Cox from Succession, who um, I'm sure most people don't know, but he taught acting in the Soviet Union for two years. And then he wrote a book about it, and then he convinced the BBC to do a documentary called Brian Cox's Russia. So we kind of had this perfect um, marriage of um, a lot of people who found Russia interesting and who are actually very gifted and qualified. You know, before we get into the rest of the movie, I just have a quick question because I know I, everybody grows up seeing people on television and the movies and they have fantasies about marrying them or dating them and stuff. So you actually got to marry a actor. So how did you guys meet? Well, first, let me tell you that I was born and raised in the film industry. And my father told me no actors. <laughs> that worked out well. <laughs> so um, I worked for the, I was working for the LA Times. And in um, 1981, they sent me to, um, to New Delhi to interview the fortune teller 
of a famous Italian director named Federico Fellini. And so after I finished the interview, he said, show me your hand. And he told me, sorry, Costa, you're gonna marry a man from a strange country. <laughs> so, okay, I, so for the next couple of years, I, every time I went to a strange country and I went to a lot of them, I kept thinking, you know, is this the country? Am I gonna live in the 13th poorest country in the world in Africa? What, where is this man who is supposed to come and be part of my life? Um, and then um, um, I moved to Rome um, and um, he came to the, he, he, had, he had one, Oleg was escaping. He illegally crossed the border into Austria from Yugoslavia. He came to Rome to go to the US embassy and defect. And he had one, one phone number basically in Rome. And that was an American actor named Richard Harrison. And by chance, I had given up one apartment in Rome to get a better apartment in Rome. And I had a month in between and I was staying at Richard Harrison's house. And that's how we met. Oh, wow. That's a cool story. I mean, not too many people have a story like that when they meet their, when they meet their spouse. So that's, that's really cool. Now, uh, Costa, let's talk about you a little bit. Tell me a little bit about your background in the acting industry. Um, I started, uh, started acting in, in theater in Russia, uh, many, many, many years ago. I think it was uh, five or six, what I remember my first sort of acting experience of looking out and, and sort of seeing the world through the eyes of somebody else, the eyes of a stranger. And that really is something, it, it was really that something that, that, that stuck with me and something that I still remember as an experience. And it's something that, that regardless of what I did in life kind of continued to bring me back to acting or rather to storytelling. I don't, I don't think act, it's, it's acting as, as sort of standalone. And so uh, from theater, there was a, when I was living in New Zealand, there was a, a, a progression to television and to film. And then in Australia, it kind of started to pick up the pace. Uh, and then I came to LA probably 11, 10, 11 years ago. And uh, it kind of, you know, was a natural progression for a, a storyteller from, I guess, anywhere in the world is to come to either LA or New York or London or one of the places where it's kind of, um, these stories are made. And, uh, and, and here I am, I kind of, I just never left. You know, I came here to check it out and have a cup of coffee and then hang out with the people who I thought at that point were my tribe. And that was it, you know, I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with the fact that here, here and, and, and John can, I'm sure, confirm it. Here is the, the only place in the world where you walk into any coffee shop and you see people breathing and feeling and, and, and talking and living storytelling. I'm not saying acting, I'm, I'm not saying directing, storytelling. You know, here, especially before the pandemic, back in the day when I came here, you walk into any coffee shop and you see people talking about short stories and scripts and short films. Let's do this, let's do that. Everybody had an attitude, a very go-getter type attitude and everybody wanted to tell the stories and give something to this industry. And I, for the first time, realized that this is, these are my people, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not actually as black of a sheep as I thought I was. Um, there are people, normal people, barely normal people <laughs> who, uh, who I can sort of uh, fit in with and uh, that was it you know I, I you know went through the song and dance of, of staying here and then now I'm here and now I call this this place home and I love it uh, whether it's LA or New York or anywhere else in between I do feel that storytelling and not again I, I i make it very specific it's not acting it's storytelling i think that's very very important and it doesn't matter of the of the medium it doesn't matter if it's scripted or documentary you know scripted as a fictional uh short long theater it doesn't really matter it's all about giving the voice to those who wouldn't have that voice otherwise it is about like joan said traveling around the world and, and trying to collect the stories through journalism and then letting people read about those stories letting people into that world that they wouldn't otherwise be a part of 
So that's kind of how I see it. To me, it's about giving the voice. To me, it's about having a voice and having something to say. And to me, right now it's acting, but you know, I, I direct, I produce, I write. And so to me, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of stories out there where I would not be able to be, I would not be a part, be a part of that story or storytelling process as an actor, but I'm sure I can help in some way. If I can help that production team by like here rendering my voice or, you know, making a cup of coffee or bringing cables or, you know, connecting with some other people who can help, I will do that because I believe it's very important to, to do what we do. I, I do believe that storytelling is is kind of really the last resort right now to kind of still connect with people and, and emote people and provoke the way we think. So let's talk about really quick how you were a part of this movie. You said you're the voice of Oleg. So how how did you, what was your part in this as the voice? Were you like going back and talking about like conversations like you were pretending to be him? No, I was literally that. I was literally the voice. Um, um, Brian wasn't a, so a bit, I, 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 probably John is, is a better person to talk about the whole process of putting the film together. But once the film is put together, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a video role. It's a video role. And in, in, in John's particular project, uh, there, is, uh, there are sections which, which are reenactment of events that took place years ago. So when there are reenactments, uh, there are actual actors being uh, a part of the scene. Let's call it a scene. But then for the whole duration of the video role, uh, there is a narration which, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you and Nadia and a whole team of writers, you guys wrote a script, right? Uh, and then Brian narrated the script. And in that script, it was, uh, it was a, exactly that. It was a narration. It was a point of view. It was a story, right? Like you would read a novel. And then within that story, within that novel, within that narrative, there would be moments where uh, stories were told from Oleg's point of view, his most personal stories, his most sacred stories, his most influential stories. And this is where the decision was made to have that differentiation between the, the actual narration, which is sort of in third person, and have somebody to narrate it from the first person, from the Oleg's point of view from the first point of view and this is where I came in and um, did that or we'll tried to do that. <laughs> now Joan tell me a little bit about this whole process I mean for some people you know there's it's difficult to put a, a, a documentary together knowing that you were married to him you ha kind of have some of the some of the connections that they wouldn't have to sit there and research as much um, but on the other hand you're still going to have that so what was the biggest challenge for you to put this, this documentary together? First of all, I just want to say that the words that, that Costa speaks in the movie are from Oleg's autobiography. Oh. So we didn't make it up. Um, what was the most difficult? Um, my husband had a big life. Just, it was um, big. And uh, we couldn't even, and, and, and we had 90 minutes and we couldn't even get part of it into there. So that was um, what to leave out was was a problem. It was hard. So did you actually physically write the, the movie and get the idea for the movie and somebody else like directed it? Or um, how, how did you come up with the concept of how it was going to lay out? So we had a, um, a writer. He doesn't want to be called a screenwriter who um, has done other documentaries before. Mm -hmm. and he was also a co-editor. And he was very skillful at combining parts of Oleg's autobiography um, and what Oleg had written um, with all of these interviews that we did. And not all of which we could use, but they're in the book. Um, and so um, he, would, he would explain part of it and um, uh, his co-star or one of the, or the director or whoever would would speak as well 
So um, the first American film he did was Red Heat with Walter, with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So we interviewed Walter Hill, who was the director, and he explained that um, when he, he tried to hire Oleg at the beginning, he wanted him to play the bad guy. <laughs> and so he brought him back four times. And, um, and then finally he said, you know, Oleg, the camera doesn't think you're bad. You're, t- <laughs> you're, it, you're just not bad. So I'm going to give you a different part of someone who's really good and the camera will see you that way. And that was actually how he began his career in the United States as a good guy. But there weren't a lot of good guy parts for, for Russians in 1985. We were still in the Cold War and he would walk in to um, um, a casting director and they would look at him and say, well, you're not Russian, you're really good looking. What's that supposed to mean? Say, well, because during the Cold War, we didn't see a lot of good looking Russians. Oh. And okay. we especially didn't see, by the way, a lot of good looking Russian women. They kept them, they kept them locked in the Soviet Union. Yeah. They still, they still, they still aren't many parts for, uh, <laughs> for, for positive, let's call them positive uh, characters of Russian origin, or Eastern European origin altogether. It's still kind of, uh, very much, uh, you know, you know, a one direction type thing. It was like, you don't look like a KGB agent. You don't like a, look like a criminal and you don't look like, you know, a government thug. So why are you even here? Wow. You know, I can only imagine what it was like to go through and relive your husband's story. And some of it you probably experienced with him. Some of it you probably didn't before you guys met. How emotional was it to actually see this thing play out and watch it when it was done? It was very emotional. Um, The the good news is that, um, you know, I'm an ex-journalist, so I obviously did a lot of research. And I interviewed a lot of people. And um, the truth is that um, I would say that Oleg was right in what he wrote 95% of the time. So it wasn't like I met someone who said, oh, no, that's not what happened. You know, there were some variations because you're looking back 50 years, 60 years. But there was nothing that was different than the way he told it. Wow. That's pretty pretty incredible. Now... Uh, Liz, this is for Costa. Uh, how did you find out about this particular role so that you could physically go out and, and um, audition for it? And what made this role appealing for you to even try? Um, I got a call from Joan. I didn't really have to audition for it. She rang me up um, and um, we had a conversation about, the, well, I, I guess to answer the first part of the question, it, it, I didn't have to audition. Uh, Joan offered uh, the opportunity to me um, to as to what was appealing. Um, it look what wasn't. Oleg has uh, has lived an incredible life. Uh, he has been a, a tremendous artist, and I'm not gonna say actor because he did so much more than just act. He was a tremendous artist, and he influenced not one, but a few generation of people in the Soviet Union, people in Eastern Europe, people in the United States through uh, wider released films, uh, and also people who he called friends as well. What what I personally, I mean, look, I was only preview to uh, his acting work. And then through meeting John and through doing my research, I, I watched a, a ton of different interviews and and his uh, uh, original films in the Soviet Union. And um, he had so many people that he called friends and there were so many people who looked up to him as their friend as well. He was an incredibly personable person. He was an incredibly open person. He was one of those people who would walk into the room and the room lit up. Everybody wanted to be his friend. and. You know, they don't make it like that anymore. There are maybe a handful of people we can think of. Everybody wants to be one, you know, especially amongst the the actors, the artists, the thespians. Everybody wants to be that person who walks in and the room changes. But not many people are. And he was that person. He was that person who would walk in and everybody wanted to have a conversation with him. I wanted to be his friend, wanted to, to know more about him. 
And uh, I, I found it incredibly fascinating looking into what made that person. You know, the person doesn't start when he moves to the US or Italy or anywhere else. The person starts when he is born. The person starts with his parents. I found it incredibly fascinating learning about his parents and, and, and his, uh, his, his heritage and where he comes. That's what makes the person. And in the documentary, that's what I personally look at. I think John has been able to do a tremendous job in putting it all together and giving the audience, the wider audience now, an insight into who that person was. Not just your husband, uh, but the person, the human being. So I thought it, it's, it was a tremendous effort and I just wanted to be a part of that process. I wanted to be a part of that journey and I'm privileged to, to be a part of that and, and had something to say about that. Well, being Russian yourself, um, I, I don't know too many uh, actors or actresses that really come out of Russia. I mean, I don't know how, what it's like for film over there. I don't know what they can do stuff as like they, they can here. I don't know if the film industry is the same there as it is here. It may have changed, but um, I know that his, his ability to do what he's done coming from Russia made him a pretty standout guy. I mean, this is, this is something that made him, you know, he, he made, he made uh, Russia famous through his own works. And, and that's, that's awesome. How, how is it with the people over there that, that are in films? Are there a lot of people that have gone to what he's been able to do in the film industry from Russia? Well, look, Russia has had a tremendous uh, history in film. Uh, I would say Soviet Union, not okay. Russia. Uh, so, I mean, the forefather of acting, Konstantin Stanislavski, is Russian. Most of the Russian pedagogues uh, teaches Russian. Uh, Russian theater, Russian ballet, Russian arts, yes. uh, Russian cinemas, uh, uh, Russian directors are being studied in film schools around the world. So, massive influence yeah. on uh, film and television and, 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 and other avenues around the world. That's what it was. Then, you know, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, that industry disappeared. And uh, Russian, uh, Russian filmmaking took a long time to get on its feet. Uh, I'm not by any means a specialist to talk about that. I'm sure there are people a lot more qualified, people who actually work in Russia. Um, but he, he was one of the kind. You know, like, I, I, I mean, the best way I can say is like, again, the, there are a lot of people of his generation and generation after who wanted to be that, uh, whether in the Soviet Union or Russia or, or, or around the world, but through different, for, for, for different reasons, they couldn't, you know, uh, all, uh, Oleg made his own choices. He made a choice to leave the Soviet Union. He made a choice to run, escape, you know, you can either run from something or you can run towards something. You know, as an artist, it, nobody can judge. You don't know what the, what the circumstances were and you don't know what it takes and for a person in his situation, of, a person of his ability in his situation to feel so restricted. You know, it's like you take a bird and you put a bird in a cage, the bird dies. Right, because a bird can't figure out how to run uh, to to fly away. If a bird can sure. figure out how to fly away, it's gonna fly away, and that's pretty much what happened. You know, there are some some creatures. Let's let's say that some creatures are just not created to to live in in uh, in captivity, and and um, for better or worse, uh, Oleg was able to escape. I guess for better, because now we. We are able to learn more about him. You know, he met John, and and John took uh, this story here, and Oleg was able to work here and write here, and then now we have this documentary, which is an insight into his life. And I I know from personal conversations with John that there are a lot of people, not just women, but a lot of people of that generation who remember Oleg very very fondly as a terrific terrific actor. They remember his films. They're they're able to quote his films, and uh, not many actors can say that. You know, not many artists can say that 
they made such an impact on somebody else's life. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, the Russian ballets and the orchestras are second to none. They are amazing. And uh, I, I love ballet. So I, I've watched a lot of Russian ballets and man, they are just timeless. So, uh, you know, I do appreciate those every year and that I get to see them. Now we are running out of time, unfortunately. So Joan, uh, let's kind of finish up with this particular documentary. I know it's in some film festivals. Uh, I think it's currently here in Florida too, which is really cool. Uh, tell me a little bit about where it's going to be, where it is now, and of course, how people can see it. Well, um, it's on the festival circuit, as we say. So it's um, in at the Global Peace Film Festival in Florida now. Um, it's headed for um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Okay. Um, and then it's headed for um, the uh, United Nations Film Festival in Palo Alto. And then the next day, the Newport Beach Film Festival here in Southern California. Um, I'm just trying to remember them all. And then um, we're headed for another festival in Moscow. We premiered at the Moscow International Festival and now we're going to another Russian festival. And then we're going to a festival in um, uh, Estonia, which was also part of the Soviet Union and to Italy. And it just keeps going. It's very exciting that um, that we're getting into so many festivals and it's really interesting. Costa, you'll see now, because he's, he's coming with us to Palo Alto and to Newport Beach that um, in most of these festivals, half of the audience are are, are, are former Soviets. Wow! And they're, and they're crying and they're so emotional, and the other half are Americans, kind of like you who are saying, "Wow, I didn't really know all this about that country." Yeah. I didn't even know very much about the country, or maybe if they were like your parents' age, they're saying, "Oh my God, you know, we were afraid of that country for so many years." Yeah, we were. We were taught to be afraid of it for sure, and. Um... Is it available anywhere online or anything like that that people can watch? It will be. We're, in, we're beginning now the process of getting it distributed. Okay. But first we wanted to go to festivals and, you know, win prizes and, um, you know, just kind of build the reputation so that we could get the very best possible um, deal that's available. I'm not talking about financially as much as um, we just want, we want people to be able to see it. Sure. And um, so sometimes you sell it to um, television, sometimes you sell it to one of the streamers, sometimes you put it into um, cinemas. It's just, they're just many combinations. And so sure. we're looking for what's gonna share his story with the most amount of people. Get that. Now, obviously in these film festivals, you get a lot of responses, you get to see people's reactions. What's been the reaction? What's been some of the feedback? Well, the Russians are all crying and they're saying, oh, thank God, we finally know what happened to him. <laughs> um, and a lot of the <clears throat> women still have postcards that they brought with them when they left the Soviet Union 40 years ago with his picture on it. Aww. I mean, I can't believe that they emigrated with his picture, but they did. Wow. Um, and um, the Americans are just sort of, a lot, the Americans like from the film industry, they said, oh, you know, we watched all of the artistic films, the ones that, you know, were, um, you know, won, won best foreign film Oscars or the Cannes Festival, but we never knew that there was the rest of this incredible industry. We never knew that they made comedies. We never knew that they made love stories. We never knew that they made um, fairy tales. And so for um, that audience in the US particularly and in um, uh, um, Europe, they're like, they're amazed. Really, it was that big. It was like Hollywood. Um, and um, so, I mean, and I, and I think that a lot of people who, whose parents ran away from communism or they ran away from communism or somebody in their family was in like a prison camp in, during um, World War II, it has particular meaning. And there was a, a publicist who now works with us who after he saw it, he said, I'm giving you six out of five stars because my parents, one of them came from Bulgaria and one of them came from um, Poland and they escaped by hiding in the top of a train wow. underneath the roof. And when, when the train crossed, it was about to cross into West Germany from East Germany. And someone came and opened the, that part where they were hiding 
and looked directly at his mother and said, no, there's no one here. Wow. Well, I appreciate you guys both coming on. This has been a lot of fun. Once again, what's the name of the movie? And is there a website that they can find out more? It's called Oleg, just O-L-E-G. And the website is um, olegvidovmovie.com. All right. Well, thank you guys both for coming on. This has been so much fun. I got to learn about a new country and some of the people that have come from it that's helped, helped entertain us for years. And I appreciate you both for all your work and effort that you put into it. So thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks, Emma. And guys, we got to take a quick commercial break. Got to pay bills. And I will be back in about two minutes. Don't go anywhere. Like, OMG, you were on TV and junk. 